Okay, I think we're all set. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining our briefing on the city of Philadelphia's response to COVID-19. A reminder, this is for press only. If you're not a member of the press and you logged into the Zoom room, please log out and you can watch on one of the live streams. Please be aware that like we did last week, Changing the order of things because of the length of Dr. Farley's comments and likely questions, uh, there are a number of questions. We want to ensure there's enough time for that. So we're going to move Armando's translation of the opening remarks until the end of questions at 2 p.m. The Q&A portion, so will come after Dr. Farley finishes speaking and Spanish language reporters should still ask their questions during the regular Q&A and Armando will translate. We are going to begin our briefing with opening remarks from Mayor Kenny. Mayor, you have the floor. Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. I was pleased yesterday to take part in two Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day activities. I only wish I could have been at all the great activities that took place across our, across our city. This is always one of my favorite holidays, not only because it honors a great man, but also because it symbolizes the commitment to service that so many Philadelphians demonstrate every single day of the year. Your commitment to service has been particularly important during the pandemic, and that brings us to why we're here today. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Philadelphia has crossed a significant threshold as we continue to battle COVID-19. The total number of confirmed cases of the virus in Philadelphia has now topped 100,000. This is an unfortunate reminder that COVID is still very much with us. And I have no doubt that without 10 months of hard work, Dr. Farley's leadership, precautions, and yes, restrictions that none of us like, we would have had, we'd have hit that dubious milestone far, far earlier. The vaccine will take months to fully roll out, so our diligence and our devotion to helping others must continue. Of course, we are hopeful the end will come, particularly with new presidential administration in Washington. Tonight, the Presidential Inauguration Committee, <clears throat> excuse me, is hosting a memorial to remember, the, uh, remember and honor the lives lost to COVID-19. Philadelphia is among the thousands of cities, towns and homes across the country to join Washington DC in illuminating buildings and ringing church bells. The national moment of unity and remembrance will be at 5.30 p.m. So we ask all Philadelphians to join in by ringing a bell at 5.30 p.m. And by tuning in at 5.30 for a ceremony with President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris featuring the first ever lighting of the Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool to honor those who have died. As we distribute the COVID-19 vaccine, we can never forget that this virus has already claimed more than 2,300 Philadelphians lives. At a time when so many of us are grieving the loss of family, friends, and neighbors, it's important that we honor those we lost. So I'm proud that Philadelphia is taking part in this national memorial and illuminating our communities this evening. And now to Dr. Farley for his update. Thank you very much, Mayor. I have better news today. Our COVID case counts are falling. I'll update you on that and update you on our vaccination effort. So first here are the numbers. Uh, since this time yesterday, we've identified 551 new cases of the coronavirus in Philadelphia residents uh, confirmed by the PCR test, bringing us to a total confirmed 101,629. So passing that 100,000 milestone, unfortunately, in the past week. And in addition, we've identified 73 new probable cases by the rapid antigen test. Now for the past week, from January 10th to the 16th, we averaged 476 cases per day. That's PCR and antigen tests combined. Uh, that so far, we expect more. And of those people tested 7.6% were testing positive. Both of those numbers are lower than what we saw the week before. Uh, the week before we were at 635 cases uh, and 8.8% of the tests were positive. So definitely a decline here in Philadelphia, and that's in the context of declines in cases all around us. Pennsylvania and New Jersey and the United States as a whole are now seeing decreases. I believe this is a downside of the spike in cases that occurred from gatherings that happened over Christmas and over New Year's. We expected that a spike would occur. And we expected we'd be seeing the downside around now, and it has happened. That's good news, uh, but let's remember that case counts are still very high, and so we still need to be taking the precautions we've been talking about. Now in our city hospitals, this morning there were 538 people with COVID hospitalized. That number has continued to decrease since mid-December. I do think we are past the, the concern that I had before that our hospitals will be overrun. So we won't be reporting that number on a weekly basis right now, unless it becomes something that's a worry again. As far as deaths, uh, we have zero new deaths identified since yesterday. 
now up a total of 2,720 uh, confirmed deaths. And we peaked at about 100 deaths per week uh, for the weeks of December 13th through the end of December. Now there's a delay of about three weeks between when we see a peak in cases and when we see a peak in deaths. And there's also a delay in reporting of deaths. So we'll have to follow that numbers here. I hope we'll be seeing a decline in deaths from here. Those numbers uh, of 100 per week are still very high, much higher than we want them to be. Not as high as we saw in the spring, but still very high. And that's because of the peak in cases we've seen with this winter wave. Now, let me talk a little bit about this new uh, United Kingdom variant of the coronavirus. Since the past, in the past week, uh, we've identified two patients in Philadelphia area with the B117 variant. The first was a woman in her 50s who had symptoms in the last week in December, who lived in both Philadelphia and in Bucks County, uh, and was exposed to someone who had traveled to the United Kingdom. The second was a man in his 20s from Philadelphia who was tested on January 5th. We don't have any information yet on whether there was any connection to the United Kingdom. So these two cases are a sign that as expected, this B117 variant is here in the Philadelphia area. Now the impact of this variant on the spread here is not known. It could be that it's more infectious and it could make the epidemic worse here in the city. The main thing we need to take from this now is we need to be even more consistent with wearing masks and keeping distance from others. Now let me update you on the vaccination effort. Uh, we're making a lot of progress, uh, but we still have to manage some pretty serious problems. We have a low number of doses that we're receiving. We have a large number of people who are eager to be vaccinated, even as others are hesitant to be vaccinated. And our federal information and our federal guidance, unfortunately, keeps changing, which makes it difficult for us to plan. Now here's the progress so far. Uh, we have been vaccinating in what we call phase 1A. That includes healthcare workers and people who live in nursing homes. So far, we've vaccinated 72,481 people with first doses who met that definition. In addition, 15,662 people have now received their second doses. Now, those numbers include people vaccinated in the community as well as people vaccinated in nursing homes. But in our nursing homes, the pharmacies have now visited 35 of the 46 nursing homes in the city. They have vaccinated about 2,500 residents and about 2,100 staff. Because they're finishing up with those nursing homes, they'll soon be moving to assisted living centers and personal care homes. Now, let me talk to you about the vaccine availability. Uh, this week, we were allocated 10,725 new first doses of the Pfizer vaccine and 10,000 first doses of the Moderna vaccine, plus second doses that matched the first doses we received in the past for people who are coming due for the second dose. Now, the vaccine we have is for, to be used for people who meet our priority groups in the community, as well as in long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, and personal care homes. Now, the Federal Health and Human Services had announced that they were going to be releasing a stored amount of vaccine. So we were expecting a large increase in the amount of vaccine we're going to be receiving. But then last week, they said that no storage amount existed. This changing information definitely makes it difficult for us to plan. So now we've been told that we will continue to receive about 20,000 doses per week of the two vaccines combined plus the appropriate second doses on a weekly basis through the end of February. That's true, we will continue to have a very limited supply through the end of February. Now we know that many people are eager to be vaccinated and that's a very good thing, but it's simply gonna take months before we have enough to vaccinate everybody right now who wants vaccine. So we do ask for people to be patient. Let me talk then about our distribution process. Last week, the hospitals uh, told us that they were nearing the end of the work of vaccinating their patient-facing healthcare workers, the people in phase 1A. Likewise, we're seeing progress in getting the unaffiliated healthcare workers vaccinated. So this week, while we're continuing to vaccinate the unvaccinated healthcare workers, we're gonna to begin to move into the very large group of people that's in phase 1B. That includes frontline essential workers, includes people who live in congregate settings, includes people over the age of 75, and includes people with high-risk medical conditions. So effective today, we're asking hospitals and federally qualified health centers that have vaccine to start offering vaccine to their patients with the highest risk of the conditions that meet our definition of phase 1B. That includes these conditions. First, age over 75, then patients with cancer, patients who have chronic kidney disease, patients who've had an organ transplant, and patients with diabetes mellitus. Now, I should note that this is not all of the high-risk medical conditions that are listed in our priority scheme. 
We're gonna recommend expand to more later, but we're just beginning now. Even so though, those people who meet those criteria are a very large group. There are some 93,000 people in Philadelphia who are over the age of 75 and over 130,000 people who have diabetes. So even if only some of those people want vaccine, it's gonna take many weeks to get through that list. Now the hospitals and the federally qualified health centers will invite patients uh, and uh, within that group, they may start inviting people who are the highest risk among them and start with the highest risk and work their way down. It's gonna take many weeks for these people on this list to get vaccinated. Eventually they'll get to everyone, but ask again, everyone to please be patient. Now, while the hospitals are doing that, the health department will be working with organizations employing frontline essential workers to offer vaccine. Because of limited doses, we'll start at the top of that list, frontline essential workers and work our way down. Initially, we'll be vaccinating or offering vaccine to first responders like police and fire, corrections officers, service providers who work with vulnerable populations and people who work in public transit. Now, it's gonna take us a few weeks to get through those groups. We will not get to food service workers or teachers or child care center workers yet. We will notify them when we're ready to get to those groups. Let me talk a little bit about planning. Uh, we've been asked to clarify better where the vaccine is being made available. Now that information is constantly changing uh, and I summarized it at a very high level last week at the press conference. I said the vaccine would be available at hospitals uh, and in clinics like federally qualified health centers and the city's district health centers, occupational health clinics, pharmacies, and on-site vaccination uh, in congregate settings and some mass vaccination clinics. But there's more detail we have. And so we put more detail in a vaccine distribution plan that we'll be posting on our website today. I just remind people because the situation is changing very rapidly, the plan is gonna rapidly get out of date. It's gonna have to be revised frequently. Now, uh, we know that many people are interested in giving this vaccine uh, and we want, and people wanna know how they can be notified when their priority group is reached and when they're eligible to get the vaccine. So as we move down the priority groups, we will be using a variety of lists that we have other, or that other organizations have to notify people that they're eligible. For example, we'll be working with school systems to have, that have contact information on teachers when we get to teachers. And we're working, as I said, with healthcare providers and health plans who have contact information for um, patients who have high-risk medical conditions. But those lists won't be perfect. They won't include everyone. And so uh, those interested in the near future can indicate their interest in getting vaccinated on a city webpage. We'll have one page for interested individuals and another one for interested organizations that have essential, wor essential workers in those organizations. Now, let me be clear, what's available on the website is not gonna be a registration for an appointment. There's no scheduling involved here. It's simply an expression of interest. We'll let people let us know that you're interested in getting the vaccine and leaving your contact information. And then when people are eligible, we will contact them about how to schedule an appointment. Now, because we have so few doses and so many interested people, it may be weeks or months before they're notified, but people will be notified when that group becomes eligible. Now that's um, sign up uh, is not available yet. It will be accessible through our main webpage, www.phila.gov slash COVID. And it'll go live sometime later this week. That's it for vaccinations. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our restrictions, our safer at home restrictions. Now this past Saturday, January 16th, we backed off cautiously on those restrictions. And as you know, we allowed indoor dining to start at restaurants with seating at 25% of their approved capacity. And all the restaurants we encouraged to improve their ventilation to reduce the airborne spread of this virus. Uh, we in, uh, encouraged them to maximize the percent outdoor air in their HVAC system, their heating, ventilation and air conditioning system put in a filter in the system that has a MERV, M-E-R-V, value of 13 or greater, and that they have enough air flow through that to achieve six air exchanges per hour, at least. That means the air turns over on average every 10 minutes. Now that's what's happening in restaurants. And just remind people that we continue to not allow indoor catered events because those are clearly much greater risk and indoor social gatherings of any size. This is the primary way today where the virus is spreading from one household to another. Now, detailed guidance on all of the settings where we have restrictions are on our website. Uh, and as before, I have to remind people that we will reinstitute restrictions if the case rates rise and if we have reason to believe the virus is spreading at these sites. In particular, if this new variant becomes a big problem in Philadelphia and we see a big increase in cases and we're worried about the hospitals being overrun again, we may have to reinstitute those restrictions. I hope not. So what should people do now? 
same as before. Just to remind people, as much as we're really excited about the availability of the vaccine, the vaccine unfortunately will not help us get through this winter wave. Just not of it, not enough of it arriving to do that. We need to use the tools we already have to get through the winter wave. That means no indoor gatherings, no parties, no inviting friends over, no sleepovers for the kids. And I have to say this now because of the season, plan now, no indoor Super Bowl watch parties. Uh, Super Bowl watch parties where a bunch of people are together and eating are just as dangerous as Thanksgiving. If you do want to get together, do it outside. And if you can watch the Super Bowl, I think you can watch the Super Bowl outside with masks. And if you go out for errands, wear a mask everywhere. And these precautions are true for everybody, whether you've been vaccinated now or not. So that's the news today. More, all of our information is on our website, www.fila.gov slash COVID. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Farley. And we are now gonna to move to the Q&A portion for members of the press. And as I noted earlier, we will have Armando's translation of the mayor and Dr. Farley of their opening remarks uh, when we conclude the questioning at 2 p.m. Now, though, a reminder that please ensure your Zoom login name includes your full name and media affiliation. Anyone logged in without listing their full name and affiliation will not be called on. Today, we're joined again by Managing Director Tumar Alexander. Also with us today is Dr. Caroline Johnson, Deputy Health Commissioner, and she can uh, help with questions regarding the distribution of vaccines. Because of limited time, only one representative from each media outlet is permitted to ask questions in the first round. I will announce when the second round begins. Reporters, as always, are asked to limit their questions to three or fewer. And of course, the uh, first round of questions should be on the topic of COVID-19. Uh, if we have time, we will take questions in later rounds on other topics, including the matters unfolding in Washington. If your hand is raised now and it's not a question on COVID, please lower it and we'll let you know when we open it up to broader topics. So for now, let's start off with Mitch Blocker of NBC10. Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Farley, uh, can you talk a little bit about how the Biden administration taking over changes vac vaccination planning uh, and logistics for, for the city of Philadelphia? I know you've been interfacing with the CDC uh, under the Trump administration. Uh, well, we're very excited to see the Biden administration taking over. Uh, as I said, we've had uh, a real problem with the changing information and changing guidance from the federal government. We understand that there's a shortage of vaccine, and I understand that it may be impossible for the federal government to make more vaccine arrive more quickly. But it's impossible for us to plan if we don't know how many doses we're going to have two weeks from now, or if they change direction every couple of weeks on who we should be vaccinating. So consistency and communication is our main request to the federal government. We have, uh, I've had conversations with some of the incoming uh, members of the Biden administration and <clears throat> that message has been heard loud and clear by them. So I'm, and I'm excited to have that more consistent communication. Uh, thank you, sir. And, and speaking of uh, communication logistics, I guess uh, it kind of rolls downhill. The Black Doctors uh, Consortium has, has been vaccinating people today and, and a little bit over the weekend. Um, and they're one of those groups who uh, receives doses from, from the health department and um, I guess over the last 24 or 48 hours, um, they're one group that is not necessarily known how many doses they've been receiving. And I'm curious, why, why is that happening? Are, are hospitals receiving more notice? And do you think this will be different moving forward? Uh, well, I'm not sure uh, what's been communicated to them. I think we try to be clear with them about how many doses are available to them. Uh, and we just say, none of the people who are providing vaccine are happy with how many doses that we're giving them because there simply are not enough to go. Uh, so we will try to be more uh, clear farther out how many doses are gonna be available for all of our providers. You know, we, we have not known from the federal government how many we get, uh, but uh, I, I think, you know, you know, I'd say there's probably been some uncertainty with all providers. Um, and and one, one last question for you, the additional vaccine candidates that are up for FDA review in the coming weeks uh, with the system that's in place, in terms of scheduling, in terms of supplies, are we able to accommodate more vaccine? Uh, I believe so. You know, these other vaccines, I think, have less complicated uh, storage and handling requirements than the two vaccines we're receiving now. These two vaccines are particularly uh, difficult and complicated to store and handle. I think the vaccines that are coming up are far simpler, uh, and so we can use the same distribution mechanisms. There's, there's enough capacity, though, to, to get more 
into the system? If we had more doses, we can absolutely make more doses available through our distribution. Yes. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, Mitch. Let's go now to David Melandra of Philly Sports Network. Two questions. First off, for the mayor, um, back in July, you put a ban on large public gatherings until February 28th. As of right now, are you willing to keep that ban until February 28th, or are you looking to extend it? Uh, whatever Dr. Farley tells us. Um, doctor, do you have any plans to change that? No, right. Uh, February 28th is a long way off. Uh, and so our current restrictions are our current restrictions. We're just going to have to see what happens to the epidemic before we make a decision on when they expire. Is February okay, 28th and- a significant date or something? Or just the end of the month? You know, we, we had to put some um, okay uh, some end date on, on any restriction. All right. Okay. And my second question for Dr. Farley, there was a report last week about from Major League Baseball saying that they are want to have fans in the stadiums this season, and they're going to leave it up to each team, including leaving it up to each city and state health departments regarding like what would they require for fans to lay on the stadium. Can you just give us an idea of what you'll be looking for from the Philadelphia Phillies about what – will it take to let them have fans in the stadium for this season? <clears throat> well, first, uh, regardless of what the Phillies say, we're going to have to look at what's happening to the epidemic. If, uh, if this new variant gets here and case rates are raging, then we're going to be very uncomfortable with any sort of large gathering. Uh, but if case rates are low, we're going to look at uh, how uh, much space there are between people uh, at any kind of uh, stadium gathering um, and what they do about uh, enforcing mask use. That's the most important things that they would be doing. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. Let's go down to Jeff Cole of Fox 29. Yep. Hi, folks. Uh, For Dr. Farley. Dr. Farley, uh, President-elect Biden says he wants to do 100 million doses of vaccine in 100 days. Is that realistic? Uh, If they can deliver that many doses, our proportion amount uh, during that time period, we absolutely can get into people's arms. You think there's that, I know you've said in the past, and we've asked you specifically about it, you've been concerned that uh, the major manufacturers simply can't produce much more than what they're pushing out right now. Do you you have some sense that uh, they can upgrade it in some way or at least fit what Biden seems to want to do? We've been given no information about the actual production process and uh, in the production numbers. The only information we get is what the federal government says here is how many we can give to you. So I'm only making assumptions that there are limitations on the production process, and I can't give you any speculation on whether it's possible for them to ramp up that production. One more. Uh, it, you, we were asking about the black doctors because they have been uh, you know, publicly vaccinating. We've had some access to them. So here's generally what I think. They did 500 Saturday, 500 Sunday. They'll do 500 today and 500 on Friday. So about 1,000 a week. Is that what organizations like theirs, I know there aren't a lot they're doing what they're doing, is generally what that generally is what their allotment is going to be going forward, what the city is providing them, about a thousand a week or so? Uh, I don't have the exact number. I don't know. Uh, Dr. Johnson, can you uh, answer that? Um, yes, that is correct. We are committing to them roughly a thousand doses a week while we're still in, we're still constrained by our supply. We get about 20,000 doses a week of which oh, 10,000 are the Moderna, and that's what the Black Doctors Consortium are using. So they're getting about 10% of the supply that comes to Philly. Really quick, do you have any ability to help them with staffing? She says she'd like uh, more folks to just put it in people's arms. Uh, Dr. Johnson, you want to answer that question? Sure. Um, Yes, we have something known as the Medical Reserve Corps, which are our volunteer nurses and physicians and other providers who are going to staff many of these clinics and can act as surge capacity for groups like the Black Doctors Consortium. Uh, Right now, there's not really enough vaccine to call them up, but we're happy to uh, supply volunteers to assist with their efforts. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Thank you, Jeff. Let's go now to Jacqueline Lee of 6ABC. Hi, Dr. Farley. Uh, Can you explain, so Dr. Levine just said they are expanding uh, phase 1A to include people age 65 and older, but you said in Philadelphia it's for people 75 and older. Can you explain that disconnect? 
Yeah, so you know we have a, a priority system that was developed through our local vaccine advisory committee. The state has their own priority scheme, uh, and they are different. Uh, and so I'm not going to say that the state's is is wrong or ours is right. But I just said they are different. Uh, our advisor, our priority scheme uh, was developed in part because we recognize an awful lot of people who are at risk in Philadelphia do have these chronic medical conditions. Particularly around, you know, we have to concern ourselves with racial equity here. Uh, and many people, uh, African American folks, have diabetes or, or heart conditions that put them at greater risk. Uh, we want to make sure that they have uh, early access to vaccine. Uh, and um, somebody who was 65 and healthy maybe shouldn't be in front of them in, in line. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit complicated that our system is going to be somewhat different from people in the suburbs. Uh, but we do think this is the right decision for Philadelphia. Okay, and then also, uh, when it comes to people signing up, we have some viewers who don't have computers, smartphones, or internet. Um, and then do you still want people to use the COVID ready website? Let me be clear, I think there's been a lot of confusion around this. So I'm glad this question came up. There is a website that was set up by an organization called Philly Fighting COVID. That is not the city's website. They have set up that website. That is not the city's website. The city will have a website late, sometime this week when people can sign up. Uh, now it's only for people who have internet access or they can get there through a smartphone, uh, but the city will have a, a sign up. In addition though, we do think that most people who become eligible will get notified through these other mechanisms we have through lists from the healthcare providers or their employers. You're muted, I can't hear you. Yeah, Jacqueline, uh, were you there finished? We yeah, yeah, yeah go um, ahead. So the, the website the city's putting up, though you said you can't really directly sign up, you can only just show interest. Right, that is the same as the, the websites that these other organizations have set up. My understanding is they're not scheduling, that's just the name is there and then they receive an invitation later. All right, Jacqueline, uh, are you good? Yeah, let's move on now to Laura McChrystal of the Inquirer. Um, on the, to kind of go off of the question about the state's plan to vaccinate residents over age 65, Dr. Farley, can, do you have any um, plan for when that age group in the city would be able to start getting vaccines, like in which priority group? They're in priority group 1C, uh, so that's going to be further down the line here. Now, I should point out, though, that many people over the age of 65 have these chronic medical conditions. So the people who are vulnerable over age 65 will be eligible uh, you know, if they have the conditions I just gave you soon. Okay. Um, and then as far as the group 1B, the way you broke it down today was kind of almost into sub priority groups, you know, starting with age 75 and those medical conditions, then moving to some other essential workers how long do you expect each of those groups to take? Like, is there any guidance you can give on when other people in 1B will start getting their shots? Uh, so first, just to be clear, the, the way that we laid out our priority scheme has sort of two columns. One is the frontline essential workers and the other is the people who are vulnerable by nature of their condition or where they live. And so we're gonna be working down both of those lists sort of simultaneously in the general order in which they're listed on that, that summary. Uh, but to answer your question, how long will it take to get through that is very hard to predict because we don't know how many people in those groups are going to want to have the vaccine. Just because they're eligible doesn't mean that they will accept the vaccine. Uh, I can say it's going to be some number of weeks, uh, and maybe months, because there's a very large group there in 1B. Okay, and just to clarify, you said you're working simultaneously through these two columns, but then is, is it correct that starting this week, it's only going to be for people over age 75 and those with these health conditions such as diabetes? Or will you also be starting other frontline workers? We'll be starting uh, frontline workers this week or they, they become eligible this week. Now, we have to work with the organizations uh, and they may not necessarily be ready, uh, but some of them may get started this week or if not, the next week. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Laura. Let's go to Manny Smith of CBS3. Dr. Farley, with all of these uh, different um, categories of folks who can get vaccinations and, and when they can't and how they differ from the state, are you concerned about vaccine confusion and what are you doing to kind of address that? Uh, you know, I'm concerned, <clears throat> excuse me, it is complicated, it's gonna be difficult. 
Uh, we're simply trying to be as clear as possible with our information on our website and information with our providers. Um, and in, you know, there's some that's pretty simple here. You, if you're over 75, that's pretty simple. Uh, if you're a healthy person under 75, you're not eligible. That's pretty simple. You know, if you're in, if you're a frontline worker, you're going to be notified by your employer. Uh, so yes, there'll be plenty of confusion. Yes, there'll be, unfortunately, many people who want to have this vaccine but can't get it for some period of time because there's not enough of it. Uh, but that's just simply the, where we are right now with the number of doses available in the country. Outside of the definition. Manny, Manny I, I just wanted to add part of what we're doing also is expanding the amount of time that you all have for questions because we understand that there is confusion and we want to uh, make sure that you folks are clear so that you can help spread the word about where things stand. Thanks. We always appreciate you guys on that. Um, my second question for Dr. Farley is that with the groups like Philly Fighting COVID and the Black Doctors Consortium, they have been distributing vaccine a little outside of what the definitions you gave in the presser today. Um, again, just to make sure that, hey, we're not making anyone who received it feel guilty or, hey, uh, or, or have people understand what's allowed to be distributed. Can you explain the relationship with those groups and, and how they're going to determine eligibility? We have, uh, you know, all of the providers who are getting vaccine, including those groups, have been told here's what the priority schemes are uh, and here's the people who should be vaccinated. Now, if people come and they uh, say something that's not true, they say, you know, I'm a healthcare worker and it's not, uh, it's impossible for those groups to be aware of that. And so they'll probably vaccinate those people. So while we're doing that, we're also trying to communicate to the public about who is eligible. Up until, you know, a couple of days ago, it was only healthcare workers. Uh, now we are expanding these groups to a limited number of other groups. Uh, so all we can really do is just try to communicate as clearly as possible. You know, some people will slip through who are not in those eligibility groups. We do think the majority of people who are being vaccinated are in those groups. Uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, the, the system is such that if we try to uh, tighten it up so much that we're certain that every single person was el that was vaccinated was eligible, then we would greatly slow down the process. And we also have an interest in getting the vaccine out as quickly as possible. So uh, there will probably be some people who slip through who don't meet those eligibility groups. My last question is for uh, Mayor Kenny with the change in administrations um, and the, you know, this, this mix up in vaccine availability, are you planning any additional, you know, um, you know, advocacy for us to get more in this case or have any talks? I think, about, uh, I think, that, I think that's going to happen naturally due to a light years improvement in competence uh, in this administration coming in. I mean, I think that, that the, 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 one of the, sad parts of the Trump administration, in addition to his mindset and his divisiveness, has been the total incompetence of the people of him and the people who work for him, uh, telling us one thing, doing another, not following through, not keeping promises. Uh, I suspect that with uh, the folks that I've seen, the lineup I've seen coming into government uh, this week, um, we're going to have uh, just a natural increase and in improvement in this whole system. Uh, and I think that President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris uh, know that cities with lots of people are a priority and that we'll try to figure out a way to get us what we need, not only in, um, in, vac in vaccines uh, and testing, but in, in just overall support, uh, financial support. I'm really looking forward to 12 o'clock tomorrow. All right. Thank you, Manny. Let's go to David Mural, Philly Mag. Yeah. Hi. Uh, question for Dr. Farley. Um, out of the, I'm wondering, out of those weekly allocation of 20,000 doses, um, if you have a sense going forward for the 1B group, how many of that 20,000 will be going to hospitals who are vaccinating the 75 plus community versus the health department clinics that you alluded to, um, you know, where you'll be uh, vaccinating first responders? I mean, do you have a rough sense of sort of of what you're receiving, what breakdown will be going for each side of your column structure? Um let me first just clarify that the uh, hospitals will be vaccinating not just the 75 plus, but also people with those high risk medical conditions. Let's see, Dr. Johnson, let's see if she can answer in a general sense for sure. you know, the distribution breakdown. Right. So um, roughly half of the 20,000 is in uh, the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, which requires the ultra cold storage. And we have ultra cold storage is fairly exclusively located in hospitals. So I think you could 
sort of make the assumption that the 10,000 doses requiring ultra cold are going into the hospital system. We split them across the network based on the size of the facility and anticipated number of patients, but that's roughly what the hospitals are getting. Got it, thanks. Um, and it also sort of maybe this is for you as well, Dr. Johnson, but as it relates okay. to distribution, um, it's question of second doses. I mean, I, you sort of, Dr. Farley alluded to the changing prioritization, you know, in changing kind of instructions from the federal government, but I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out the, of the, of the weekly 20,000 doses, does that, is that 20,000 doses for people receiving first shots, then you're also receiving a second amount for second doses or are the second doses yeah. being lumped into that 20 K since I know there's not a reserve anymore that there, they said there used to be. Uh, correct. So they are not lumped in those 20,000 doses are for first shots. And we get our second doses actually shipped on a different day and are counted a little bit differently. So we're not including that in the 20,000. And finally, I, are you, um, I don't know if you have data on, um, since you're nearly completed with the nursing home vaccinations, but I'm interested if um, you have data on the percentage of eligible people so far who have accepted the vaccine, since it's obviously sort of a slightly different population than healthcare workers. Yeah, we don't have accurate uh, data on that because we don't have good uh, denominators for how many people are residing in those nursing homes or how many people work in those nursing homes. Um, just, you know, from what you've heard about some individual places that have um, uh, reported us, it's a fairly high percentage of the residents are getting vaccinated, maybe three quarters. Uh, it's a smaller percentage of the staff that are getting vaccinated, at least on the first pass, probably less than half. Uh, but now that they will be going to these nursing homes multiple times, so I would expect that those numbers may rise with uh, subsequent passes. For example, if they went there on a given day and an employee didn't work that shift, then that employee didn't have a chance to be vaccinated. But when they come back another time, if the employee is then working, then that employee has a chance. Thanks. All right. Thank you, David. Let's go to Jaime Bessarel of Telemundo. I mean, can you unmute? Yes, good afternoon, how are you doing? This question goes for anyone who can answer, please, and it needs to be translated by Armando after the question, please. Yes. Uh, the first one is, how can Hispanic people older than 75 years old that don't have access to the internet register for the vaccine? <clears throat> uh, Dr. Johnson, you wanna answer the simplest response to that. Uh, hold on, I think our Can we interpret the question first? Okay. Sure. Yeah. The question is how do people and minorities, especially Hispanics older than 75 years of age without access to the internet can register to receive the vaccination? So I would say that the first thing would be to check with uh, their healthcare provider that they're used to seeing. We have vaccine located in several of the clinics that are located and serving the Latinx community. So uh, that would be my first recommendation is to contact their healthcare provider and see if they have the vaccine available at that time. Um, as part of our effort to get this, this registration portal online, we also are going to bring up a, a phone tree or some kind of call in line where we will assist people in making appointments. So that's the, the future plans. Bien, eh, lo que quiero decirles primero es que revisen los que estén interesados y que califiquen, que son los ciudadanos minoritarios mayores de 75 años de edad con su proveedor de servicio de salud o médico de cabecera primero. Nosotros hemos distribuido vacunas en las clínicas que están sirviendo a la comunidad Latinx. Esa sería mi primera recomendación. Tenemos vacunas disponibles y estamos trabajando para implementar un portal de registrarse en línea y vamos a tener una línea de ayuda que pueda proporcionar asistencia para lograr las citas. Gracias. Ok, y mi segunda pregunta, por favor, va para el mayor. Does does the city have a plan or strategy to help 75 years old, uh, 75 year old people with no technology to get information about the vaccine? Um, Let me uh, do the yeah, interpretation okay. of the question, Mayor, okay. if you will. Uh, does the city have any plan or strategy in place? Pardon, en español, <laughs> disculpen. 
hay algún plan o estrategia que tenga la ciudad para ayudar a aquellos ciudadanos mayores de 75 años sin acceso a la tecnología para obtener información respecto a las vacunas. Go ahead. I would, I would, ask, I would ask either Dr. Farley or Dr. Johnson. Le pedimos al Dr. Farley o a la doctora Johnson que nos respondan, por favor. Uh, you know, I would get back to what Dr. Johnson said. So that most people do get health care in the city, whether they uh, are getting it, whether they're insured or not. Uh, typically, uninsured people are getting health care at federally qualified health centers, such as the city health centers, but also including other federally qualified health centers. And, um, and then um, there are some other clinics that are specific to, to uh, serving the Latino population. We'll be working with all those clinics to make that available. Um, and then uh, they, you know, people can contact those clinics. Those clinics may also be reaching out to those patients through telephones. Quiero reeditar lo que dijo la doctora Johnson. La mayoría de las poblaciones que obtienen su cuidado médico, ya sea que tengan seguro médico o no, lo hacen a través de centros federales o como los centros de salud de la ciudad. Y hay clínicas que prestan servicios específicamente a la comunidad latina y ellos van a tener la vacuna disponible y es ahí donde deben acudir para obtener información con respecto al proceso de vacunación también. Ok, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Jaime. Let's go to Johan Calhoun of Chalkbeat. Hi, Dr. Farley. Um, asking for clarity here, this is my first question. Um, educators are still listed in subgroup 1B, but they will get the vaccine at a later date. This is from what, what I'm understanding. Can you give a realistic time on notifying teachers, educators on when they can get the vaccine? And I ask this because I see that they are listed in subgroup 1B, but there's a number five next to their listing. So can you give a realistic time on when you think your office will be notifying the teachers when they can get the vaccine? Yeah, so first that number five next to their name it actually points to a footnote that just defines who's in that group better. Uh, but we are gonna be gradually, sequentially working down through that list of frontline essential workers. Uh, I know people wanna know a date when we're gonna get to them and I would love to give them a date Unfortunately, I can't because we don't know how many of the people above them are going to want to be vaccinated. If everybody above them wants to be vaccinated, it means it's going to take us longer to get through there because of limited doses. If a small percentage of the people above them choose to be vaccinated, then we move down more quickly. I can say it's going to be some number of weeks, but I cannot say how many weeks it'll be. And also doctors can correct me if I'm wrong. A large percentage of our teachers do not live in Philadelphia, but live in the counties and in New Jersey. So if they have the availability of getting a vaccination in their own community, um, they should do that and re reduce the number that we have to be responsible for. Is that correct? That is correct. correct. Thanks. Uh, that's a perfect segue. Um, th thank you, Mayor Kenny, for my next question. So if you teach in Philadelphia, but live in the suburbs, do you follow Philadelphia's guidelines? How does that work? Um, I don't, I personally don't know, but doctors, that teacher specifically are complicated. Dr. Johnson, you want to answer that? So the vaccine allocation in this country is based on population. So that means Philadelphia's not, number of doses that we get is based on the size of the population and has nothing to do with who's working in Philadelphia. Uh, we, we try to protect uh, our vaccine so that it goes preferentially to Philadelphians, but we are not in a position where we can turn away essential workforce because they don't live in Philadelphia. So I think the, the strategy that we would like to see is that people not living in Philadelphia seek vaccine outside of the city, as the mayor had said, but in order to get our schools back operating, uh, if we need to vaccinate people living outside the city, we will do that. Okay, so that's, okay, just for clarity. So mm -hmm. that's a strike against the teacher. If the teacher uh, teaches in Philadelphia, but let's say they live in Monco or Bucks County, that's a strike against them in getting the, the vaccine. Not a strike against them from us is we will, we will cover them if they have not gotten a vaccine from their other, uh, from the county where they live. So we're not aware of what the protocols are in these surrounding counties. They have not said anything about when the teachers are gonna be eligible or what procedures have been put in place to vaccinate uh, teachers who live in other counties. Yeah. What I'm saying is that if they do not get vaccinated, 
um, we will take responsibility for them. Excellent, excellent. Um, Do you what, have one more, Johan? Yeah, yeah my, my third question Very is, quickly. if, if teachers if teachers get vaccinated, what about their family members, like their husband, uh, wives, children, or is it just the teacher in that household? It is only the teacher. So the eligibility for the essential workforce is based only on the person doing that position. All right, thank you, Johan. Let's go to Martin Pratt of Philly YBN. Uh, give me a second, I'm having problems with my device. Okay, this question is for Dr. Farley. Um, have you seen the news in, out of California with Moderna? They've stopped issuing the vaccine because of the extreme allergic reaction. Are you concerned at all about our batch of Moderna? I have heard uh, of one jurisdiction or one, one location. I felt they had an inordinate number of severe allergic reactions, and so they stopped vaccinating there. Uh, unclear what's happening there, but here in Philadelphia, our experience has been quite good. We have not had a large number of allergic reactions, and we don't think that we should stop based upon that. We do screen people when they come into the vaccination sites for any history of serious allergic reactions. We are prepared to deal with them when they occur. Uh, so not quite sure what happened out there, but we're not concerned about what's happening here right now. And will there be, or is there contact tracing uh, follow-up a week later with that patient that did receive the vaccine to be able to establish that there is no uh, obvious side effects? Well, there, there is a process for looking at adverse uh, reactions to the vaccine that's been in place at the federal level that people participate in. They can opt to be uh, followed up with by, uh, I think it's an app on the phone, and they can provide their um, any uh, problems that they had, you know, days or, or weeks after. The only serious events that have occurred from this vaccine that have happened in a matter of minutes afterwards. So uh, the most important step is that after people are vaccinated, they stay around for 15 minutes to make sure that there's nothing in the immediate period that's going to be bad. And if so, they're taken care of. And those <laughs> problems that have occurred have been very rare. And so just for clarity, that's on the patient to be able to say, yes, here's some feedback, city of Philadelphia or provider. I do feel nauseous and sick, and I have been that way for seven days. Yes. OK, and still the last question. Uh, the, we, you said uh, 1C uh, for frontline workers. Does that include um, not just police officers that are that are on duty, but also the police commissioner, department heads? Is that just, or is that just going to be the beat the beat cop and the cop in the that's out on the um, in the cars? Oh, yeah. uh, ask Dr. Johnson to answer that question. Okay. So we have said that active duty police officers are eligible for vaccine in this. Uh, a first release. That's how we have defined it. And, and that's the, all the way down to, up to the commissioner. Sorry. Well, high, high commanders high up in the department are often on scene uh, immediately uh, after shooting or homicide or, or a major crime. They go out quickly, including the police commissioner. Uh, so they would be on the front line. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Martin. Let's go to Jenny DeHoff of Philadelphia Weekly. Hi, how are you? Um, thanks. Manny Smith may have already asked my question, but I guess I'll follow it up with this. Um, we mentioned Philly fighting COVID earlier and that they are not affiliated with the city. Um, have you seen any evidence or any reason to believe that organiz organizations like this are stockpiling or <laughs> even hoarding vaccines for any reason? First, let me just say, I, I did not say that Philly fighting COVID is not affiliated with the city. The vaccine that they are delivering is vaccine that the city has gotten. We have given them that vaccine to provide to patients. Um, and, uh, and we have often had staff there, uh, but, but they're operating that site. But we don't have any evidence that, that, that any of those organizations are hoarding vaccine. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Jenny. Let's go to Ayanna Jones of the Philadelphia Tribune. Yes, good afternoon. I was wondering, where um, where the city is in terms of racial data for vaccinations at this point? Do we have that available? Yeah, the, uh, it, it's posted on our website. Uh, I did not look at the percent uh, by uh, race in the past and today. Uh, it has been running about 10% African-American, which we said before is definitely too low. Uh, and <laughs> that's 
probably caused by a combination of some places there may be barriers to being vaccinated uh, and people just having vaccine hesitancy. So we are, you know, we have worked with the providers to try to make sure that they can talk to folks about their concerns. Uh, and we're talking to community leaders as well around the vaccine hesitancy problem. Uh, but the, our, that number is updated on our website. Uh, there's a graph that has uh, the racial breakdown. Okay, and piggybacking on that in terms of the, the issue around hesitancy, what is the department doing specifically? Um, I know you mentioned something about talking to some to some people, but there, are there any efforts being driven specifically by the health department to help alleviate some of this hesitancy, to help you know kind of push the needle and, and get that percentage up higher yeah. at this point? So, um, so first we are talking to existing providers about them so we're talking to and listening to the people who are hesitant to try to understand what the issues are and see if they can uh, persuade people to reconsider for their own health. In addition to that, we have started conversations with community leaders. I was on a call yesterday with uh, uh, Delta Sigma Theta sorority and the black clergy to talk about vaccination. We've had many of those meetings. We're going to have many more conversations like that with community uh, based organizations and community leaders. In addition to that, we have in the works a media campaign to encourage people to get vaccinated. Uh, that media campaign will probably launch sometime in February. We, uh, we don't think it's a good idea to run it right now when the vaccine is so limited uh, because we think it may frustrate people to say, you know, get vaccinated if the vaccine isn't available. But, you know, we're trying sort of multiple levels to really communicate about the value of the vaccine. We say, I, I completely understand why people, African Americans in particular, are hesitant um, given their history in this country. But I also think it's in their best interest to be vaccinated and we need to have just lots of conversations uh, to, to deal with that. Absolutely. And my, um, my other question, I don't know, someone may have asked this earlier, but um, I think it was yesterday when Ayla, Dr. Ayla Stanford from the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium was, um, had, had brought up the possibility or had called for uh, National Guard troops to help push out vaccinations. Is that, a, is that something that might be considered down the, down the line? Do you see what, oh, go ahead. You know, I don't think that that's gonna be necessary and I don't think that that's necessarily the wisest way to go, even if it were. Uh, we have organizations like Dr. Stanford's group <laughs> that have the capability of vaccinating. Our biggest limit right now is not vaccinating people, but rather vaccine. Uh, and um, if we had more vaccine, I still think we can find other groups. And the National Guard as a you know, military looking group wouldn't necessarily be welcomed in a variety of communities. So, uh, you know, maybe at some point we get there, but uh, I don't think at this point it's appropriate. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ayana. Let's go to Kennedy Rose of the Philadelphia Business Journal. Hi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farley and Mayor Kenny for taking the time today. Um, my first question is for Dr. Farley. Um, getting off the topic of vaccines really quickly, I was just wondering how have the first few days of indoor dining been? Uh, do you have any concerns or highlights? And I know it's early, but have there been any discussions to increase capacity? Because some restaurateurs we've talked to have said that they are not going to reopen indoors until capacity is increased. Yeah, you know, um, I have not heard any reports from uh, our inspectors out there. Um, just walking around Center City, I saw an awful lot of restaurants that were opening, uh, that were open, uh, and uh, that they appear to be following the, the guidelines. And so that was a good thing to see. Uh, I was pleased how many that were. I, I think I'm sure that there's some that say that they can't open at that number, but it does look like the majority of them are. Uh, at this point, we're not ready to uh, expand that capacity. Or we, uh, while the case counts are falling, they're still uh, over the sweep of this epidemic at very high levels. You know, 400 cases a day is an awful lot of cases per day. Let's remember, you know, back in the summer, we were down, you know, 70 cases per day. Uh, and there's still a lot of risk, and we have this variant that's may be circulating. So and when we feel that it's safer, uh, we will see if there's a way to very cautiously take the next step. Okay, and uh, I remember you mentioned briefly uh, today and also last week uh, that the health department was going to issue some guidance about improving ventilation inside indoor uh, restaurants and indoor dining so they can increase capacity. Um, I was wondering if there's any sort of timeline on when that guidance would be released. Um, I can't say yet. I, I, we're working on trying to move it as quickly as possible. Uh, we want to have conversations with uh, you know, restaurants first before we release it because it's kind of complicated. Uh, but uh, I don't want to say we're trying to do it as quickly as possible. 
Okay. And my last question is also for you, Dr. Farley. Um, for the form coming out later this week or next uh, for organizations and individuals to indicate interest in receiving vaccines when they're eligible, uh, is this only for organizations with employees that are in uh, phase 1A and 1B, or is this just for any organization? Um, well, it's, it's purpose is really to look at organizations that would have essential workers. So that could be in 1A, 1B, or 1C. Uh, but there's an awful lot of organizations that have workers who would fall in those categories. Okay, thanks so much. All right, thank you, Kennedy. Let's go to Max Marin of Billy Penn. All right, thank you, everybody. I'll keep this quick. Dr. Farley, you made it clear that Philly Fighting COVID's registry page is not involved with the city whatsoever. Um, does this mean that the health department does not have oversight of the medical data that was supplied by the 60,000 residents who use that pre-registry uh, site to date? The health department has access to data on patients who've been vaccinated, but we don't have access to the information on people who have gone to that site and registered. Okay, thank you. Unless, I mean, I guess Dr. Johnson, Correct me, and is that correct? That's correct. We get information on everyone that they vaccinate, but we do not know who is signing up for the site. Okay, thank you. And why aren't the other healthcare systems like Penn and Jefferson helping with the uh, vaccination program for the general population the way that they are in New Jersey? Well, the uh, major health systems are helping with vaccination. We asked them first to go to do their healthcare workers, and they did, and that was following national and local recommendations. And now that they are, they're not complete that, but they're getting close to being complete with that. Now we're asking them to go to deal with the people that they have the best access to, which are people who have uh, these chronic medical conditions or people over the age of 75. Okay, Max, you good? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, let's go. We only have a couple minutes left, so please keep your questions as tight as possible. Denise Clay, you're up. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my question is for Mayor Kenny. Um, Dr. Farley mentioned um, restaurants upgrading their ventilation in order to keep the um, virus from, you know, really having an impact for indoor dining. Is there anything that the city um, is doing to kind of help restaurant tours who might want to upgrade their HVAC systems? and may not have the money to do so right now, particularly because of the pandemic? Well, we don't have any money either. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we're waiting to see what the federal government does uh, in the Biden administration when it comes to uh, resources for cities and states. I mean, we're, we're still, you know, we're, we're still in a, you know, hold pattern as far, far what our future budget is going to be like uh, and replacement revenue uh, that is on the table now and has been advocated for by the Secretary of uh, the Treasury designee uh, in on Capitol Hill today or this morning uh, bodes well, hopefully, for us getting this, these additional dollars that we can help more people. And we've spent tens of millions of dollars on on um, on rent relief, on all kinds of things. Um, we have not looked at what the cost factor would be in in providing resources for restaurants to to uh, rehabilitate or or change their exhaust systems um, it, it, we would have to wait and see how that goes. Have you spoken to the president elect about some of the issues that are unique to Philadelphia as he approaches the whole $1.9 trillion COVID bailout package? I have not, but I've spoken to the vice president directly. Uh, I've not spoken to the president directly since Labor Day when he was in for, uh, for more, uh, sorry, uh, for Memorial Day when he was in uh, in for a ceremony. Um, but um, um, the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, articulates the needs uh, for cities directly to the administration, and our, our uh, information is with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go now to Claudia Vargas of NBC10. Okay. Um, Dr. Farley, I think this question is for you. When a city employee tests positive for COVID and they notify their supervisor, what does the contract tracing process entail? I said, right now, uh, as you know, when, when case counts went very high, uh, we're not doing contact tracing for everybody. We're only getting about half of the people that uh, are uh, reported to, to the city. Now, if an individual a city employee uh, tests positive, that information goes to the safety office of that office for them to deal with trying to prevent people from spreading to other folks at the workplace. 
So we at the health department may not be involved in that at all. Okay, and will the contact tracing process determine how the employee contracted the virus? Uh, in general, no. The, uh, the, the purpose of contact tracing, remember, is to prevent in, and the infection to pass on to other people, to prevent the future. Uh, it's not, very difficult, if not impossible, to find out how an individual employee got infected, and that's not the purpose of the process. We sometimes find some information, but that, again, that's not the purpose of it, and, and we certainly couldn't prove it. Okay, so can anyone for certain say how an employee contracted the virus? Uh, it's virtually impossible to know for, to prove how any individual person got infected. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. We have two more hands raised. Let's try to squeeze those folks in. Tracy Davidson, also of NBC10, you're up. Tracy, you're up. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. D Dr. Farley, I know the health department partnered with Rite Aid to distribute to 1A, uh, but they are not limiting it to healthcare workers who live in the city. What's being done to correct that? Uh, we're working with Rite Aid on their procedures and asking them to follow the standards for who's in the priority group uh, and also trying to encourage people. Right now they're vaccinating healthcare workers um, and <coughs> they don't necessarily have to live in the city. Dr. Johnson, correct me if I'm wrong, then we vaccinated. There's healthcare workers who would work in the city. But it's supposed to be just healthcare workers. But they have said that that's against their company policy to limit people either registering through the website portal or in their stores. Uh, well, we are working with them to try to have it be only healthcare workers. If this continues, we will have them not be vaccinating healthcare workers. We'll have it be something that's more uh, verifiable. You know, I think part of the problem is individual responsibility too. You know, you know if you're jumping the line or not, uh, and that's not good karma for you. Uh, and if you're taking a vaccine away from a 75 year old person or a person who has existing illnesses, then, then you ought to examine your conscience and not do it. Well, we're hearing from healthcare workers who aren't able to get their second dose right. because uh, yeah. other yeah, people I... have jumped the line with Rite Aid because they're saying we cannot limit who we give it to. Well, as doctor said that this is being looked at and if they're not going to follow our guidelines, they're probably not going to be involved in the program. I think everyone ought to be able to get their second dose. That's very important. And so if the, if it's true that people are having difficulty in their second dose, we are going to uh, work very hard to solve that problem. Yeah, I have a dental hygienist who's mm. gotten her first dose and she can't get an appointment for her second dose. And she's very worried that the time will lapse. Tracy, we're out of time. Did you have another question? That's it. I'm good. Okay, Thank very you. Very good. And let's go finally and quickly uh, to Perla Lara of Impacto. Okay. Um, ellos siempre mencionan que eh, para todo lo que se relaciona con la comunidad hispana eh, se tienen a estas organizaciones que trabajan con los latinos en Filadelfia, pero ¿cómo se aseguran que ellos estén trabajando bien? Eh, porque creo que con 16% de la población hispana latina en Filadelfia, ellos mismos deberían de tener las eh, herramientas para llegar a esa población que evidentemente no están siendo efectivas. Tanto para el mensaje de la vacuna, como para vacunarse, como para el distanciamiento social, etc. ¿Por qué usar otras dependencias? Perla, Perla, we're very much over time, so I need you to make your question as concise as possible, please. Thank you. Uh, this is a question that probably is best answered by the mayor. Uh, it, Carla tells us that there's always uh, saying, you, the city saying that there's Hispanic based community organizations that are helping with reaching out to the Hispanic community and the Latinos in Philadelphia, which amount to about a 16% of the population. However, how can you guys tell that these organizations are doing a good job at all? Uh, how is the city providing them with tools to do it? And couldn't the city itself direct its approach to the Hispanic community directly <laughs> Uh, through the messages for vaccination, keeping social distancing and such. How is relying on the service organizations being monitored for effectiveness? That would be Dr. Farley or Dr. Johnson. Just say we- Esta respuesta la del Dr. Farley o la Dra. Johnson. All of our communications are not just in English, so they're also in Spanish. And they're directed through a variety of different channels to uh, Hispanic community uh, through you know publications as well as community-based organizations. Uh, so it's 
you know, we, we can't control any individual organization, but we can try to work with through organizations that represent a community for them to get the messages and also get the messages out to individuals through these channels. We'll continue to do both. Dr. Farley nos dice que nosotros trabajamos con todas las comunidades y nuestros mensajes, en este caso para la comunidad hispana, se dan en inglés y en español. Y tenemos canales de distribución que incluyen la prensa escrita, además de los esfuerzos comunitarios de las organizaciones que representan a su base. Por eso nosotros no podemos controlarlos a ellos directamente, pero trabajamos con todas las organizaciones que representan grupos étnicos y comunitarios para transmitir nuestro mensaje. Muchas gracias, Perla. No está funcionando, pero. Perla, uh, are you all set? Yes. Very good. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are now going to move to Armando for the Spanish language translation of the mayor's and Dr. Farley's opening remarks. Palabras del alcalde Jim Kenney para el 19 de enero del 2021. Buenas tardes a todos. Ayer tuve el placer de participar en dos actividades para conmemorar el día de Martin Luther King Jr. Ojalá pudiera haber estado en todas las grandes actividades que tuvieron lugar en Filadelfia. Esta ha sido siempre una de mis festividades favoritas, no solo porque honra a un gran hombre, sino también porque simboliza el compromiso de servicio que tantos habitantes de Filadelfia demuestran todos los días del año. Su compromiso con el servicio ha sido particularmente importante durante la pandemia y eso nos lleva a la razón por la que estamos aquí el día de hoy. Desafortunadamente, Filadelfia ha alcanzado un triste hito mientras continuamos luchando contra el COVID-19. El número total de casos confirmados del virus en Filadelfia ha superado los 100,000 casos. Este es un lamentable recordatorio del COVID-19 todavía está muy presente entre nosotros. Y no tengo la menor duda de que sin el liderazgo del Dr. Farley durante estos 10 largos meses de trabajo conjunto, las precauciones y sí, las restricciones que hemos implementado hubiéramos alcanzado este triste punto mucho antes. La vacuna tardará meses en distribuirse por completo, por lo que nuestra diligencia y nuestra devoción por ayudar a los demás deben continuar también. Por supuesto, tenemos la esperanza de que exista una luz al final del túnel, particularmente con una nueva administración presidencial en Washington. Esta noche, el Comité Inaugural Presidencial está organizando una ceremonia conmemorativa para recordar y honrar las vidas perdidas por el COVID-19. Filadelfia se encuentra entre miles de ciudades en todo el país que se unen a Washington DC para iluminar sus edificios y hacer sonar las campanas de sus iglesias. Este momento nacional de unidad, respeto y recuerdo será hoy a las 5 y 30 de la tarde. Por ello, les pedimos a los habitantes de Filadelfia que se unan, tocando una campana a las 5 y 30 de la tarde para recordar a las personas que han muerto durante la pandemia. Los habitantes de Filadelfia también pueden sintonizar su canal de televisión favorito a las 5 y 30 para ver la ceremonia con el presidente electo Joe Biden y la vicepresidenta electa Kamala Harris. En esta ceremonia se mostrará la iluminación de la piscina reflectante del monumento a Lincoln para honrar a los fallecidos. Mientras distribuimos la vacuna contra el COVID-19, no podemos olvidar que este virus ya ha cobrado la vida de más de 2,300 habitantes de Filadelfia. En un momento en el que muchos de nosotros estamos de duelo por la pérdida de familiares, amigos y vecinos, es importante que honremos a los que perdimos. Así que estoy orgulloso de que Filadelfia participe en este evento nacional y les invito a todos los habitantes de Filadelfia a iluminar sus comunidades esta noche. Gracias. Y esta es la actualización en materia de salud para el día 19 de enero del 2021. Hoy comenzaremos con noticias sobre el conteo de casos que van cayendo y proporcionaremos actualizaciones sobre los esfuerzos de vacunación. Comenzamos con los números del día de hoy. Para el día de hoy se registraron 551 nuevos casos confirmados por pruebas PCR. Igualmente, reportamos 73 nuevos casos probables por pruebas de antígenos. El total confirmado es de 101,629 casos. La semana pasada, del 10 al 16 de enero, el promedio fue de 476 casos diarios, incluyendo pruebas de PCR y de antígenos y el porcentaje de positividad fue del 7,6%. La semana anterior a ella, del 3 al 9 de enero, el promedio había sido de 635 casos diarios, con un porcentaje de positividad del 8,8%. Estamos viendo un descenso en el número de casos en Pensilvania, Nueva Jersey y en los Estados Unidos en general. Sin embargo, el conteo de casos sigue siendo bastante alto. 
En relación a los pacientes hospitalizados, esta mañana 538 pacientes se encontraban internados por el COVID-19 en los hospitales de Filadelfia. Con respecto a las muertes, felizmente el día de hoy no se identificaron fallecimientos. En total, 2.720 personas han perdido la vida en la ciudad debido al COVID-19. El último pico que tuvimos fue de 100 muertes en la semana del 13 de diciembre. Tenemos un retraso de tres semanas aproximadamente debido al retraso con el que se reciben los reportes. Por lo tanto, esperamos ver un descenso significativo en el futuro. Con relación a la variante del virus que viene del Reino Unido, desde la semana pasada, dos pacientes en Filadelfia se identificaron con la variante B.1.1.7 que se vio por primera vez en el Reino Unido. El primer caso es de una mujer de 50 años con síntomas la última semana de diciembre. Esta persona vivía tanto en Filadelfia como en el condado de Bucks y se expuso a alguien que viajó al Reino Unido. El segundo caso fue de un hombre de 20 años en Filadelfia que se realizó la prueba el 5 de enero. Esto nos permite afirmar que, como se esperaba, la variante B117 ya está aquí. No se conoce el impacto de esta variante en la propagación del virus en la ciudad todavía. Quizás podría ser más infeccioso aún. Por lo tanto, necesitamos ser aún más congruentes con el uso de la mascarilla y la distancia interpersonal. Con respecto a las vacunas, estamos haciendo avances, pero todavía tenemos que resolver algunos problemas. Hay un bajo número de dosis y hay una gran cantidad de personas ansiosas por vacunarse, pese a que también hay otras personas que aún dudan en hacerlo. La información y la orientación federal que recibimos también sigue cambiando. Este es nuestro avance hasta ahora. En la fase 1A se incluyeron a los entornos hospitalarios y a los hogares de ancianos. Tenemos 72,481 primeras dosis ya administradas y 15,662 segundas dosis ya administradas. Las farmacias visitaron 35 de 46 hogares de ancianos y vacunaron a 2,539 residentes y a 2,155 empleados. Con respecto a las asignaciones, esta semana se asignaron 10,725 primeras dosis de la vacuna de Pfizer y 10,000 primeras dosis de la vacuna de Moderna. Las vacunas recibidas serán utilizadas en los grupos prioritarios dentro de la comunidad, así como en los centros de atención a largo plazo, los centros de vida asistida y los hogares de cuidado. El Departamento de Salud y Servicios Humanos había anunciado que liberaría una cantidad almacenada de las vacunas, pero la semana pasada nos anunciaron que no existe dicha cantidad almacenada. Esto hace muy difícil nuestra planificación. Ahora nos han dicho que continuaremos recibiendo aproximadamente 20.000 dosis a la semana, más las segundas dosis apropiadas hasta fines de febrero. Así que seguiremos teniendo una oferta muy limitada de la vacuna. Conocemos a muchas personas ansiosas por vacunarse y esto es algo bueno, pero simplemente pasarán muchos meses antes de que tengamos suficientes vacunas para todos los que quieran vacunarse, por lo que les pedimos paciencia. Pasando al tema de la distribución, la semana pasada los hospitales nos informaron que se acercan al fin de la vacunación de los trabajadores de la salud que estaban incluidos en la fase 1A. Del mismo modo, avanzamos en la vacunación de los trabajadores sanitarios no afiliados a los hospitales. Entonces, esta semana, mientras se continúa ofreciendo a los trabajadores sanitarios no vacunados, pasaremos a un grupo muy grande incluido en la fase 1B. Este grupo abarca a trabajadores esenciales de primera línea, aquellos en entornos congregados, a personas mayores de 75 años de edad y a personas con afecciones médicas de alto riesgo. Les pedimos a los hospitales y a los centros de salud federalmente calificados que tengan vacunas, que por favor comiencen a ofrecer la vacuna a los pacientes con condiciones de mayor riesgo. Esto incluye a personas mayores de 75 años de edad, pacientes con cáncer y personas con enfermedad renal crónica, aquellos que han recibido trasplante de órganos, aquellos que sufren de diabetes mellitus, entre otras condiciones médicas. Nuevamente, repito, este es un grupo muy grande. Tenemos 93,000 adultos mayores de 75 años y aproximadamente 130,000 personas que sufren de diabetes. Incluso si solo algunas de esas personas quisieran la vacuna, nos tomaría muchas semanas el vacunarlos a todos. Los hospitales y los centros de salud invitarán a los pacientes y pueden comenzar invitando a aquellos con el riesgo médico más alto. Y aún así, tardará varias semanas en vacunar a las personas en esta lista, pero eventualmente llegaremos a todos. Y por esto les pedimos nuevamente que tengan paciencia. El Departamento de Salud trabajará con organizaciones que emplean trabajadores esenciales de primera línea para ofrecer las vacunas. Debido a las dosis limitadas, 
se comenzará en la parte superior de la lista e iremos bajando de la lista sucesivamente. Inicialmente tenemos al personal de primera respuesta, como policías y bomberos, a los empleados en los centros correccionales, a los proveedores de servicios que trabajan con poblaciones vulnerables, como por ejemplo aquellos que trabajan en el transporte público. Esto tomará unas semanas y todavía no llegará a quienes trabajan en el servicio de alimentos, a los maestros o a aquellos que prestan cuidado infantil. Anunciaremos oportunamente cuando estemos listos para vacunar a estas poblaciones. El Departamento de Salud también trabajará con entornos congregados para conectarse con el proveedor de vacunas y trabajará con las organizaciones que emplean trabajadores esenciales de primera línea para ofrecerle vacunas a este grupo. Con relación a la planificación, se nos ha pedido que aclaremos aún más dónde está disponible la vacuna. Y esto es algo que está cambiando constantemente. Lo recibimos la semana pasada en nuestra conferencia de prensa. Está en los hospitales, en las clínicas, en los centros de salud federalmente calificados y en los centros de salud del distrito de la ciudad. También se encuentran en las clínicas de salud ocupacional, en las farmacias y se dan en nuestras campañas de vacunación in situ en los entornos colectivos. Finalmente, hay clínicas de vacunación masiva también disponibles. Se puede encontrar más detalles en el plan de distribución de vacunas que publicamos el día de hoy en fila.gov. Debido a que la situación cambia rápidamente, este plan se revisará con frecuencia. Hay muchas organizaciones e individuos ansiosos que quieren saber cómo recibir notificaciones sobre el proceso de vacunación. Y a medida que avancemos a través de los grupos prioritarios, usaremos una variedad de listas que ya tenemos. Otras organizaciones tienen acceso a estas listas, como por ejemplo los sistemas escolares, que tienen la información de contacto de los profesores, los proveedores de atención médica y los planes de salud, que tienen información de contacto para personas con afecciones médicas de alto riesgo. Pero estas listas no incluirán a todos. Por tanto, los interesados pueden indicar su interés en la página web de la ciudad. Hay una página para las personas interesadas y hay otra página para las organizaciones interesadas. Este no es un registro para obtener una cita, sin embargo, únicamente es un medio para expresar su interés en vacunarse y en proporcionarnos su información de contacto. Cuando usted sea elegible, nos comunicaremos sobre cómo programar una cita. Y esta página se va a lanzar a finales de esta semana. Con respecto a las restricciones del programa Más Seguro en Casa, el sábado pasado 16, nosotros retrocedimos con muchas cautelas algunas de las restricciones que habíamos puesto. Permitimos que los restaurantes proporcionaran un servicio en interiores con un 25% de la ocupación aprobada para comer sentados. Se anima a todos los restaurantes a mejorar su ventilación para reducir la propensidad de propagación del virus en el aire. Los restaurantes pueden maximizar el porcentaje de aire exterior en los sistemas de aire acondicionados y usar un filtro MERV-13 o superior. Y todavía estamos trabajando con estándares de ventilación mejorados necesarios para aprobar un porcentaje mayor de aforo. Esto se anunciará cuando esté listo. Seguirán restringidos por ahora los eventos en interiores o bajo techo, las reuniones sociales en interiores de cualquier tamaño, ya que estas son las principales formas de propagación del virus entre los hogares. Y como antes, es posible que se restablezcan las restricciones, se aumentan las tasas de casos y hay motivos para pensar que el virus se propaga en estos lugares. ¿Qué debería hacer la gente en estos momentos? Primero, entender que la vacuna no nos ayudará a superar esta ola de invierno. Necesitamos usar las herramientas que ya tenemos a nuestra disposición. No permitir las reuniones en interiores. No tener fiestas. No se debe invitar amigos y a parientes al hogar. No deben organizarse pijamadas para los niños. Y lamentablemente este año no habrá fiestas para ver el Super Bowl o el Super Tazón en interiores. Por favor, si se juntan, háganlo al aire libre utilizando sus mascarillas cuidadosamente. Y cuando salga a la calle, debe usar la mascarilla de forma adecuada en todas partes y tomar las mismas precauciones, incluso si usted ya fue vacunado. Juntos superaremos al COVID-19, pero mientras tanto, recuerde usted usar su mascarilla, lavarse las manos y mantener la distancia social. Muchísimas gracias. All right, thank you, Armando, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. That concludes our briefing, and we will be uh, doing this again next Tuesday, January 26th. Thank you.